Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to open this presentation as I always want to open my presentation. So hi, I'm Panche, and I'll be speaking about IoT. So first of all, uh, before even I start talking, uh, this is me from last year, so J Prime 2016. Uh, I just want to thank to the organizers for having me uh, two years in a row, and you guys are making an amazing event, and so just keep up the good work and see you again next year. I mean, yeah, that goes by if I pass, you know, nice today. Um, so, who am I actually? Uh, my name is Panche. I'm a senior software engineer at this company called Netcetera. We have offices, uh, well, around the world. I come from Skopje, Macedonia. I'm the leader of the Macedonian Java group, user group. I'm one of the administrators of this uh, coding competition that we're organizing called CodeFu. Um, in my spare time and in the last one year as uh, my full-time job, I'm a hardware and IoT enthusiast. Uh, and besides all this, I'm also the initiator for the Things Network in Skopje. Uh, on the internet, you can either find me on my personal blog, panche.nk. I write something there every, I don't know, few months. And on Twitter and everywhere else on the internet by Silomedus. Um, so as also as part of the leader of the uh, Java user group, uh, I organized this conference in Skopje, Macedonia. Maybe some of you guys are already familiar with it. So we're called JavaScope. Uh, we organized one early... Um, event, it's a community conference, and you may recognize these guys. So uh, I just want to thank uh, to the entire Bulgarian Java user group for, you know, for keeping this uh, close contact uh, between the two Java user groups. And yeah, I hope that this will remain in the future. So uh, what am I going to talk uh, to you about today? So I have four topics in mind. Uh, so first of all, just a lower rank crash course, then a little bit about hardware. Then some rules and architecture, I believe that you all know, but yeah, still, they need, uh, they need to be set. And some software development bits and pieces. So if uh, they say a picture says 1,000 words, then what a video will actually say. So I would like to show you something, but just bear in mind for, the, for these two sentences. So this is something that I made. It's not professional at all, and I will accept no criticism at all after, for this video after all. So yeah, so enjoy for the next one minute. So, thank you. So I may leave now. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Shot by Pancho, yeah, everything. Okay, so let's get going. So first of all, LoRaWAN. What is LoRaWAN? Has anyone here heard something about Laura, LoRaWAN, anything? Okay, about 10 hands, perfect. So let's start first with Laura. Now, LoRa comes from long range, and it's nothing more than but uh, just radio modulation, so a kind of technique that allows you to transmit data over the air, that's all. Um, it is, it's a specific kind of modulation, it's church press spectrum, I don't want to go into the details there. Uh, but the three main uh, things that you need to know about this technique is that it will allow you to create low-powered devices that will cost you nothing more than $10, and they will work on extremely long ranges. So um, to put this into numbers, I'm saying that you can actually make some device that will uh, work by simply having a battery in it. It will work for like three to five years or something, and it can uh, transmit data over distances as much as 15 kilometers or something. Um, unfortunately, it's proprietary by Semtech, um, but that will not be that big of a problem. You'll see why. Uh, other things that are also very important for it is first that it can work on different frequencies, and most importantly, it can work on license-free free ISM bands. That means that you can spread this technology without actually getting compliance from any government or from anyone. You can just put it out there, and that's it. 
Um, now, for each frequency there, you have multiple channels, and for every channel there, you have different spreading factors, meaning you can extend or shorten the, the time which you're sending a signal, which kind of allows you to make an IoT network with a great capacity, which is good. Now, on top of LoRa, we have LoRa 1, and this is the inter interesting piece. So, so LoRa 1 stands for Long Range Wide, Wide Area Network. It's basically like a MAC layer on top of LoRa, so it kind of makes it much more easier for you uh, to send data, to receive data over the air. Um, if you ask me, LoRa 1 is the fact of the new IoT communication standard, and it will get more and more popular in the next few years. Um, now, the good thing here is, as I said, uh, LoRa is proprietary by Semtech, but LoRa 1 is something that is made by this entity called LoRa Alliance. And it's, uh, it's an alliance uh, made for multiple companies, which, uh, sort of like the JCP or something, uh, tend to drive this technology forward uh, more and more. So what are the key things about LoRa 1? So several features. For, first, it will allow you to do fully bi bi-directional communication. Now, this goes with a lot of limitation, but I will mention these afterwards. Second, it will solve the biggest problem in the IoT, which is security. And it already has that in its design, so it's already there. It will allow you to have end-to-end -end secure transmissions. Third, it's very easy to commission new devices. So uh, the device management for any provider out there is made to be very easy, and uh, you can just populate like 1,000, 10,000 devices in just a single click. No, no, not a big deal. Fourth, it has built-in mobility. So here, the most important piece is that you can actually achieve uh, GPS-free uh, geolocation, which is very cool, because the GPSs are actually quite heavy on power consumption. And here, by simply triangulating from where you're actually sending uh, the packets, you can distinctly say, okay, now this sensor or this device is placed at that position, more or less. Fifth, it has an interesting network scalability. So whenever you need to extend your network or to improve um, the density of your network, you just add one additional base station, and that's it. In theory, one base station can handle up to 10,000 devices, which is kind of cool. Last but not least, as I said, uh, this is standard. So this is not something that is made only by one company, but it's actually something made by the lower Alliance. So they have already a lot of people, a lot of companies behind it. How does the architecture look like here? So uh, on the one end, uh, we have the devices. So this is, these are the things. These are, yeah, the one piece of the story. This can be your sensor, this can be your actuator, something that reads, something that does something. Now, as I said, they communicate wireless. So the second piece here is the base stations, or the gateways, or the concentrators. They are the ones that are accepting the radio signals, converting them into TCP or UDP packets, and forwarding them on. Now, the third piece, the bit block, that's a little bit ambiguous, because from provider to provider, this can be very different. I would just call it the network server. So this is something that handles the traffic afterwards for your packets, at least uh, until they reach the final destination. And the final destination is your application servers. And now, as I said, here we have an end-to-end -end security. And now this end-to-end -end security is actually in two layers. So first of all, you have end-to-end -end security, meaning that no one will tackle with the encryption of your packets from your devices to your target application system. But also you have one intermediary uh, uh, encryption as well, and that is the network layer encryption there. So this is needed in order to have kind of like this split between, you know, what is your application, what is your domain, and what is the domain for your network provider. So they will do the job for you, and it's only up to you at the end to decode your information and just go with it. That's all. Yeah, that's all good, but still we have a little bit of limitations here. Now, first of all, if your idea is to make an IoT device which transmits video, then lower one is not for you. Now, this is intended to be for devices that um, send or receive short amount of data, short stream amount of data, uh, uh, periodically over time. So not something that is always connected. So the limitations, well, put in numbers, are like these. The speed is very low. So you have like 250 to 4,470 bits per second. There is also one additional speed, which is like 11,000 bits per second, but that is kind of reserved, so forget about it. Um, this is all configurable, so you have here like the spreading factor and the bandwidth, and uh, this is an interesting thing, because um, it has a trade-off. You know, if you want to increase the speed for transmission, then you're immediately decreasing the range for your device. If you want to achieve maximum distance, and here I say even 15 kilometers or so, then you need to go at the lowest speed as possible. This means that, I don't know, if you have like a, a packet of 20 bytes, if you do it at the maximum speed, it will take you like one millisecond uh, airtime. But if you uh, do it on the lowest speed, that it will take you like uh, one and a half second or something. So be aware of that. Second, the packages are very small. And this kind of depends from provider to provider. And be careful here. So um, 
the safe way to go is to have like 20 bytes, maximum of 20 bytes per, per package. If you're kind of making like a sensor network, something that needs to react every once in a while, I don't know, a citywide installation for smart city lights or something, then basically you won't be needing more than three bytes on a single packet. So this kind of looks crude, but if you start making your own applications, then you will see that it's kind of reasonable. If this is not reasonable for you, then maybe the domain that, you, that you're looking is not really this one and you need something else. And last but not least, here, uh, the, message, the message sending, the, the packets that you're sending or receiving are less frequent. So uh, bear in mind here about the uplinks, that is the messages that you're transmitting from your device to the network or the downlinks, which are the, the other way around. Now, this also goes by provider, so every provider will kind of tell you different limits. But again, on the safe distance, 2 to 200 upstream packages are fine, and 1 to 10 downstream packages are also fine. Now, the downstreams are very limited because, again, uh, as I said, one single base station can handle up to 10,000 devices. And just imagine if everyone just wants to receive data all the time, so it's that's basically impossible. Um, there are three uh, different kind of LoRaWAN devices that you can use. And class A is the most used and the most popular and maybe the, the only one that you will need. So class A says something like this. You can send data, then immediately after your data has been sent, you have uh, two uh, distinct windows of receiving data. And they're both separated by one second. So basically you send data, wait one second, and then you open a window for receiving data. Then you wait again one second and you open another window and that's it. Now, it may look stupid, but if you think about it, the, this is uh, the way to do a low power transmission. So uh, if you kind of make the device to be listening all the time, it will waste a lot of power, and you don't want to do that. So that's what has been done. Um, there are two ways how you can attach a device on your network. There are two ways how you can authorize it. So one is uh, OTAA, basically go over the air authorization, and it says like, hey application, this is me, please give me the keys. I want to, to communicate with my application. And it sends back some details, and then it connects again, and it resumes on with the communication. The second thing is authorization by personalization, or ABP. This kind of skips the first part. It already has everything that it needs on the device, and it just starts talking. That's it. Um, so how to do that? How to actually put some device uh, and make it start talking to, to your application? The easiest way to do that is to use this uh, microchip uh, called RN2483. This is a LoRa Alliance LoRa certified chip, which kind of has this entire LoRa One stack already in it. So in order to communicate to your application, you just can use um, Mac commands, which are already there. So it's kind of stripping you of the base physics there, and you can communicate immediately on a higher level. And how does this look like? Well, something like this. So you need to do some um, initial initializations, I don't know, frequency, then blah, blah, blah. And then here are your credentials. So you have the device address, you have the application session key. As I said, this is your encryption from, from end to end. You have the network session key. This is the network encryption that you're using. And on the other side, you have the data rate. As I said, you are configuring that. If you want fast speed, you can set data rate five. But that will kind of give you the, the lowest range. If you want low speed, but highest range, then you go with data rate zero. That's it. And at the end, you're just sending information. So you have two ways of sending information. You can say it unconfirmed, so just put it out there, or you might want for an answer from your application server. So in that case, you're uh, asking for confirmed uh, communication. Now, that's all good, but how to really do something? So we are saying we have a lower one network, but how can I make a LoRaWAN network? Should I start something on my own? Is there something already present which I can use? Well, turn out it is. So let me introduce you to the Things Network. Uh, as by definition, it says the Things Network is a global crowdsourced Internet of Things data network. It already has all the pieces that you need in order to start with your applic IoT application there. It uses LoRaWAN as its base, its base uh, technology. It's free, but it's fair usage free, so there are a little bit of limitations. And it will provide you the backend, the network server, everything else that you need. So the pieces that you need to do, to do are the, the final ends of the story. So you need to do your devices, you need to do your application. The network, the communication, everything will be handled by the Things Network, and it will be free. And it turns out this is already here in Sofia as well. So uh, if you want to see um, how Sofia has been covered, unfortunately, it's still very poor, so you have like two base stations. This area, I believe, is covered, but I won't risk it trying something like this in here, no. Uh, so you can just go to the Things Network um, slash C slash Sofia, and then you can see you have initiators, you already have team there, so if you want to join, if you want to ask questions, so please bother these guys. Okay, how to use the Things Network. So 
Well, it's rather simple. First, register, you go to the console, and afterwards, first, you need to make your application. When you make your application, then inside your application, you can register your devices. So there you say, okay, I have a, uh, if you want to do with the ABP uh, method, then you need to register every single device on your own. If you want to do with the uh, authorization of rare, there you just have a little bit of keys that you will provide on every uh, device on your own, and that's it. Uh, so besides the device registration there, uh, you can get uh, all the keys, all the UIs for your devices. You can also get the credentials that you need in order to access your data afterwards. So there are nifty ways. They provide your data in much nifty ways. And um, at the end, you have plugins. So even if you don't want to make like the full story of your application server, you can use one of these plugins. And you can connect it to if this and that. You can even use cloud storage. Uh, or you can make the things network to simply ping you to do like an HTTP post on your server. So that's completely up to you. So that brings me to the second piece of the story. Now, this might not be interesting for you, but it's very interesting for me. So I'll just go quickly. So how to do your own hardware? as a software developer, what is the easiest way? So remember these three things. Well, basically just the Arduino on the left and one of these two on the right. So the easiest way to do embedded development is to start with Arduino. It's already out there, it's off the shelf, it's easy to code. Um, there is a huge community behind it, there are a lot of examples, so it's just installing the software, seeing examples, and getting on with it. Now, the Arduino will just simply give you the core of your device, but you need to transmit something over LoRaWAN. And here you have two options. So, the first option is to use as a fully certified LoRaWAN device. And in this picture, this is the microchip. Now, this is a little bit more expensive, but this is licensed, and it has the entire LoRaWAN stack on it. So, you just connect to it via RX takes, and you just send in the Mac commands and this chip will send all the data. Unfortunately, this is very hard to get. Uh, it's currently not in production. They have some new version coming uh, soon. So you'll, you might want to try the second version, and that is to just get a plain uh, LoRa device. And you can implement your LoRaWAN stack uh, into your Arduino. So there's a library for that. It's called Elmic. So basically, the Arduino with Elmic and with this uh, chip, it's called RFM95W. Um, you can find it on AliExpress, it's very cheap, like three or four dollars or something, and you can again make your own device. Now then, let's make it this a little bit more professional. So there are very expensive tools there for making your own devices, prototyping, let's skip those. So if you want to do something on your own, get familiar with this thing. It's called KiCat, it's open source, and it will help you from uh, the one way to uh, prototyping your schematics for your device to the final way to kind of making the exports and sending them to some factory in China, let's say, and they will make everything up for you. So how does it go? Well, first, you start with this, you have schematics, then you turn the schematics into something more physical, so this is how the layout will look like. If this is not sexy enough, then you can even see it like this. So this is how everything will look like afterward. And from this point, you can export your design. So you can export these so-called Gerber files. You can send them to a factory, and the factory will bring you these. And these are the printed the print circuit boards. So you can use them afterwards, and you can do a little bit of manu manual labor. You can assemble everything. And at the end, you might just leave it like this, or if you have a 3D printer, you can make cases on your own, and you can end up with something like this. So these are the devices that we're putting uh, throughout the city of Skopje. Inside one of these devices, there is the core, uh, the core device, which is, again, based on the Arduino, the same one that you see. It has the RN24883 chip, which is the one responsible for the lower one communication, and it has a few sensors. So it can read air quality, basically like the particulate matter in the air, PM10 or NPM2.5. Uh, it can read the, the ambiental noise, the ambiental temperature, and the ambiental humidity. So just for making a proof of concept and covering the base cases, this is more than enough. Our picture on the right is me testing the device in Zurich. One very important point is that uh, it works on the Things Network, and the Things Network knows nothing about roaming. So wherever you have the Things Network, which is basically the entire world, you can use your, your devices. You don't need to answer to anyone. And the development, which is the most interesting part, here you have uh, the Arduino programming language, which is kind of like a nice shift, nice intermediary thing between C and C++. It's a very restricted environment, so you have a CPU of 16 megahertz, you have two kilobytes of memory and 32 kilobytes of program storage, so be careful with it, because you can easily run out of anything. Well, uh, here you need to use pointers, you need to use global variables, you need to use fixed size buffers, so the coding can be a little bit more interesting. And at the end, uh, your device is not something that someone can SSH into it. 
So it's something that you just need to plug it and then it should work like years without touching it. So design for perpetual non-observed exec execution. It may not halt, it may not stop at any point of time. Okay, going on. Part number three, rules and architecture. What you should know, what uh, rules you should maintain in order to make your own IoT system. Now, this is a little bit more general and yeah, you're familiar with all the topics, but again, let us repeat them. First, very important, decouple your system. Don't just make everything into one single piece and just put it up there. Uh, please clear your concerns. First of all, the data acquisition and transmission, this is something that should work on its own. It should not be bothered by any other pieces of your system. It should be fast, it should be responsive. And second, the data offering or the REST API or your own queue or whatever means you think of afterwards offering the data, this is again a different piece. These should not be connected. Um, you have the web. Web is just your presentation. It should not know for anything else of these. And again, in order to make some value out of your project, you cannot just, I don't know, relay the information, the raw information that you, that you have there. But you need to do some analytics, you need to do some processing. Please put this completely on the side. Because if you get stuck into some analytic process and if this kind of bothers the other parts of the system, then you will end up with some problems that you don't want to be there. And again, the very important pieces. Your software must be robust. So this is a very unstable area. Anything can happen. A simple light storm may actually take out a lot of your nodes. So what are you going to do there? So your system needs to be robust. It needs to be resilient towards any malfunctioning there. You need to plan scaling in front of time. So just making a system for 10 devices is not the same as making a system for 100,000 devices. So please, scale in time. And also take care of fallbacks. What happens when there really is no other way? So the long story short here is, Please use containers, please use, or, or use orchestrators. They will handle a lot of your dirt business here. Second rules, optimize. So, very important, plan for as much as low overhead as possible. This is very important, really. If you are able, use binary protocol. If you can use gRPC, say, or something similar in your application, please use it. Please make it be there. Uh, don't use asynchronous connections or something like that. If you have connected pieces through your system, make the connection to be always on. You do not want to have any latency. And last but not least, uh, also aim for short physical distance. Now, why is this important? As I said, Class A LoRaWAN devices, they have fixed rule of working, and they say, I transmit data and I have two windows of waiting the data to come back, and that I restrict one second windows. So if your, uh, if your operation, if your data processing takes more than one second, from end to end, then you're doing nothing. Then your system will simply fail. You need to be fast. And that's why all the rules. And more specifically, that's why the physical distance. So you want to have your actual servers, your actual end, end servers to be as close as possible to the network, because in that way they can respond much faster. So how you can do it here? Well, yeah, I mean, even not, not to bother that much into binary protocols and everything, just having an optimized MQTT transport all the way around will kind of do the trick. It's always on connection, and it's relatively fast. Just keep your payloads low in size. And third rule here, how can you store the data? So when you're talking about IoT, when we're talking about the data that we have in IoT, uh, IoT data, it's almost always, if not always, time series based. So you have uh, strict portions of data that are being received or, or that are being sent at certain point of time. So make your model, make your database to be centric around that. You have time series data. Uh, second, the data that you receive, the data that you will send, they follow no rule, whatever. They can be redundant. You can have two dates for something. They can be impartial. You can get one sensor to be cut off like for days or something, or just sent every one in, in three packets. So plan for that. You will have holes. You will have a lot of clustering in your data. Then make your database to be append-only. Do not use relationship data, uh, relational databases. Now, why again? Because relational databases, they need to follow their transactions inside. They need to follow their rules inside. You're immediately increasing your reaction time, and that can kill your IoT system. So use a pen on a database. Just write something. Don't wait for any confirmation. You really don't need the confirmation, because first of all, um, even getting your data, well, you're not even sure that you will receive the data after all. So just pay along with, with the same rules. Don't aggregate your data but just process your data. So say something like this. Uh, 
you have a sensor network in the city of Sofia, which is getting uh, the air pollution or something. And you want to get like the, the averages for every day for the past year. What are you going to do? Are you going to just start and pull out all the data for the entire year and just aggregate, I don't know, either in memory or in the database? That, that's kind of stupid. No, don't do it. You already have a redundant database. So what you need to do is, again, use smartly your aggregation services that you have. So every once in a while, every once in a day, pull out the data for the last day, aggregate them into one average value, and store that average value into your database. Whenever someone asks for averages, just give those averages back. Do it like this. And last but not least, learn how to live with eventual consistency. So that meaning at some point in time, I don't know, your averaging service will fail, meaning you won't have any averagings for the past day or for the past week. Learn how to do it. So something is not there, loading, or I don't know what. So one option here to go is to use Apache Cassandra. Um, also, Redis is kind of like an interesting option here as well, but I don't know, I kind of believe Cassandra more. So that's what we've used there. And at the end, following these rules, this is well, like a global thing of what we did. It's a bit old, I'm kind of missing one piece, but it's not important for this presentation. So basically, here you have the entire story. We have the sensors, which are based on this RN2482 trip. They're communicating with LoRa by using the LoRaWAN stack. The, the radio signals are reaching the gateway. The gateway is, is, um, is putting them into uh, TCP packets, UDP packages, by the way, and sending them to the Things network. The Things network sees this, then it uses its network uh, session key in order to decrypt it, to see everything that is there, it gets the payload, and then afterwards it gives us the data. Now, there is this overlap here in the Things network which you might want to live with, because still, it's a public network, it's a community network, so at the end, it even decrypts your packet. So you have them there, and in order to access it, you need to make the access, the access control to your data to be as secure as possible. So what we did here, we're using the MQTT uh, brokers that are already provided by the Things network. We're connecting to it to, with a separate container, which is not to be bothered by the entire system. And by using uh, proper frameworks there, we're getting the data and passing them onto the server. The server on its side takes everything and stores it into the Cassandra database. Again, redundant storing, so we have like multiple tables, multiple uh, records for every single data that we're getting. And you can also connect your system not just with LoRaWAN, but you can use other networks as well. So here we also connect it with um, government uh, measuring stations. They have an open API. We use that as well, so we're kind of aggregating all the data into one place. So the last piece, software development. How to put everything together. I love Spring Boot. Really, I, I think it's the best. Uh, so, from several aspects. Well, first, uh, I had like five years of working solo with Spring, so this is my known area, this is my comfort zone. I'm not a Java E guy, I'm a Spring guy, sorry. Um, and Spring Boot kind of offers everything that I already mentioned to you. So, it's packaging all the code into more efficient uh, jars instead of the more bulky wars. It's already cloud native, so meaning that you can easily deploy, easily scale your applications out there, or even use a cloud provider that can work all that for you. And what are the pieces here? So getting the data from the TTN network. As I said, in our infrastructure there, we're using the MQTT broker that is provided by the Things network. So in order to access it, we need to connect to it. And here we use the Eclipse Paho. Turns out it's very easy to use, so we're using just the Eclipse Paho client. It's very easy, it's very stable. But again, something that you need to do is that you need to implement that resilience that I'm talking about. So you need to make sure that uh, every once in a while your connection will be broken, something may happen, so that's up to you to handle. So the easiest way how to do, you just have uh, the client, you encapsulate it into a class, which afterwards can be your Spring component. You make it to uh, implement the same QTT callback interface, so basically everything will be done here. That's all. On post construct, you will connect to, uh, to your MQTT instance, to your MQTT cloud instance, and you need to make sure to reconnect on every connection failure. How to do that? You just make one watchdog, which says at every one second, well, that's not, yeah, that's not very good. Maybe one second is a lot, but let's say every, uh, no, there's actually one, one minute that I have here. Let's say that every 10 seconds is kind of like a, a nice option. So every 10 seconds, you have a watchdog checks, are you connected? If not, please reconnect. If something really goes wrong, then just kill everything and allow it to restart itself. Maybe that will do the trick. How you can connect to the MQTT provided by the Things Network, how you can use it. 
uh, how you can get the credentials and message format and everything. So just please go to uh, the official documentations from there. You have everything. You have the way how to get the credentials. You have the entire structure of the JSON uh, object that you're receiving there. So everything that you need to know is there. Second piece, how to store data. So as I said, we're using uh, Cassandra, but we need somehow to uh, connect with Cassandra. And as a Spring guy, the last piece here in this slide is very important. So Spring Data for Cassandra is not a really good option. Spring Data is kind of not, I don't know, it's not really made to work nicely with um, no SQL databases, or at least that was the last comment that I saw there, which was like one year ago. Maybe there are new versions which I don't know about. Uh, but nonetheless, at that point of time, simply this was a very poor choice. So what we did here is that we made with, with the barefoot, with, with, with the very bare minimum that we need to go uh, by making Java applications with Cassandra. So we used the Cassandra driver core, and we also used the extras for it. We're encapsulating, we're encapsulating all of this into one, our, one client that is made of our own. And this client is basically service, server, service, sorry, is a service that has the cluster inside, and does again all the connection, pointing to all the nodes in the ring, uh, making all the translation between our data model and what is being stored into the database. Second, you might want to use the instant codec here, because the data that you are writing into the Cassandra database, again, it's time series based. Now, Cassandra is perfect for time series based because it's wide column, no SQL, and you can do, uh, it has sorting based on the column names by default. So a lot of pieces that says by filtering data by date starting ending will be done very fast by Cassandra. If you use this instant codec, then you will get this immediate uh, translation from Java time to the Cassandra data storage, uh, date storage that it uses. You can use the query builder so to avoid the Husky, you know, Cassandra uh, SQL um, uh, queries. And please don't use data filtering. So whenever uh, your Cassandra instance will say, this uses filtering, you might want to change it, please change it. Because filtering basically says, I'm getting all the data, then I'm doing something with the data in memory prior to returning them to the application. Basically, this is something that you can do on your own. But even so, this is something that you need to avoid. If you get something like this, if you get like data filtering warning into Cassandra, then your design is kind of wrong. And how to, how to fix that? If you have something like this, it basically means that uh, the design for your database is wrong and that you might need an additional redundancy, something like that. So if you need ordering by some other parameter, please use a redundant, uh, redundant table. If, say, at one point you need all the data to be stored by your time series, and, but also you want to get like the data for one single sensor, please use one different table, and there you have the sensor as a column name. So use redundancy. And how to present all that? So the web piece, you need to make it to look as pretty as possible. Now, this is not the, the best job that I can do, uh, but still, I think that it works fine. Uh, since um, our application is, uh, well, kind of like an implementation for a smart city, um, it, the visualization, by definition, is to be map-based. So here, I'm using the leaflet JavaScript library. And in the background, I'm using the OpenStreetMap uh, data, getting data from the OpenStreetMap, but also using stem and design tiles, because the regular OpenStreetMap uh, are kind of interlayered with a lot of information that you will really, you don't really want to have it onto this map. And for the visualizations there, you have a lot of choices, but the one that I prefer, the one that, that I love is uh, D3. D3 is very powerful. It's basically not a visualization engine, which is interesting, and uh, it's used solely for visualization, but it will give you this uh, needed uh, transformation from your data to something that can be easily rendered afterwards on your own choice. You need to make an administrator panel as well. So if you want to make like an industrial grade IoT system, then you really need to make something for the administrators or for the users to be well aware of what is happening into their systems. So here I'm talking a full-blown single-page application. And here, go as much complicated, as much performant as you like. The thing that we did here is that we used Angular 2 alongside with this NG2 admin framework. It turns out to be perfect for our needs. And in the background, for communicating with our system, getting the data, getting everything that we need, we're using Spring MVC. We cannot use here the regular Spring data repositories, because again, we're not working with Spring data. So we're kind of making everything to suit our needs. And from here on, you can even go forward. So one thing that you can do forward is that you can extract your data. 
you can learn something from your data. Because again, if you just project everything that you're getting, if you're just offering all the data that you have there, you're, well, you're just a sensor network, you're nothing more. You're not adding any value. But if you get something from, uh, from it, say, I don't know, where does the air pollution in the city come from? What are the patterns? What are the correlations? Is something happening all the time that we really cannot see it, but it's there? This is some actual value that, that is really important. And this is just, just for smart cities. So you can use a lot of options here. Uh, one thing that we experimented with is the Apache Spark. Now, I'm not the expert here. This has been done by interns. They were the data scientists. I was just the one. I was their client, technically. Yeah. But we used Apache Spark. It has um, a nice connection with uh, Apache Cassandra. They're kind of built for each other. One time it was Apache, it, it was Hadoop, and uh, well, now it turns out that it's not that support, it's not that recommended after all. I'm not really sure about this. So yeah, you can use it like that. If you don't like it, you can use any machine learning framework that you like. Uh, in the meanwhile, we're also testing something with TensorFlow. Uh, there we're kind of making models for, for time series forecast. We'll see how that'll go, but nonetheless, as I said, it's a containerized um, environment, and you can use everything that you like outside of the regular Java system. And last but not least, my second extra piece is um, if you really must, if you really need to cover some area that is not covered by your regular network, you may use Wi-Fi devices. It's okay. But just please use them only that. Don't make a Wi-Fi-based IoT network. Why? Because Wi-Fi, for one, is very heavy on power usage. It will deplete your devices. It's bad. Second, that's someone else's network. You really don't know what's happening there. So it's not really controlled by you. And having that in mind, you will really need to step up with your security. You will need, really need to be aware of what's happening there, and you will really need to enforce even other rules to make sure that your device will be as secure as possible. Because if someone hijacks your connection, if someone finds out what are you doing there, if you don't pr protect that access at all, then your system is compromised. And someone can feed you in data which are not relevant, and then you're bust. So what can you do here? You can, instead of using the plain Arduino, you can use this device. Uh, it's called Node MCU. This is a development board, but the core piece in it is a chip called TSP8266. Um, again, it's a microcontroller unit. It's very fast. I mean, very fast. It's much faster than the Arduino. It has 80 megahertz uh, CPU um, frequency. It has four megabytes of flash, 32 kilobytes of RAM, I believe. I'm not really sure, but. Uh, the, the important thing here is that it can also work on the Arduino as well. So you can use the one IDE, you can use the Arduino IDE, you can code your regular Arduino boards, or you can code this. It has ports inside it, and besides the regular Arduino stuff, it has the Wi-Fi part on its own. So what this device can do, it can uh, search for wireless uh, networks in your home, or I don't know, in the area where it's been deployed. It can connect to a network, and afterwards it can initiate TCP requests. Now, here, please use TLS. Again, as I said, if you're dealing with LoRaWAN, then you already have the encryption done. You already have the security done. Here, you don't. If you use plain communication, then you're doing nothing. Then anyone can hijack your connection, and it can feed the system false data, which is bad. So please use TLS. There are options for it. It's kind of a little bit difficult to implement there, because you really need to be careful to the last bits and pieces for your server, for the configuration on your server, but it works. It's there. Second, third, though, you need to provision the device address securely. So this is a device which will sit in someone trace, let's say something like that, and it will communicate through its own network. So if you kind of make it easy for the user to see the device address, again, you have a security problem. So please be careful about that. And at the end, you need to implement your own address to key mapping. So uh, this is something that I skipped in the regular uh, uh, crash course about LoRaWAN, but uh, what you saw into the LoRaWAN uh, code, we said, for every device, we have the device address. This is kind of like a hash thing. It's hard to, to remember. But afterwards, this device address has been translated into something human readable. This is your actual device ID. And this is much easier to work with. So here, you really need to do that. Now, this is a topic that I can speak for the next 15 minutes only. Uh, if you want to do more, so I've written something about this on my blog. I'll give you links afterwards. Uh, there with the entire procedure from start to end. 
And now, this is something that I will not show you here, but if you're interested into this topic, if you want to know more details, not solely about the product that we made, but also uh, about the, the technology that is behind, behind the Things Network, behind everything, this is a nice video that is being done by the guys from Amazon Web Services and starring its main stars, it's me, colleagues from Zurich, and the guy uh, on the top picture on the left side, that's Johan Stocking, and he is um, the tech leader at uh, the Things Network. Things Network Global. So in this video here, you can just follow that link. In this video, um, Johan is explaining the, the basics for uh, the Things Network, how the Things Network work, just their sole principles. And afterwards, we are explaining how our system works, so that it's a little bit more on the technical side. Also there, uh, there are other companies uh, from Zurich, from the IoT stage in Zurich, and they explain also one of them are making sensors, uh, additional one are making uh, devices which can work on JavaScript, something like that, so it's rather interesting, please see it. And hence my t-shirt, by the way. This is why I'm wearing Amazon branded shirt. So, um, I believe that's all for me. And I'm like nine minutes ahead of time, which is perfect. So, uh, these are the links that I think uh, will be important from this talk. So, if you're really interested, uh, you can find me anywhere here. You can shoot me questions. You can bother me as much as you like. Um, what I would really like to, again, propose is that please find out about the Things Network Sofia. Find out who these guys are. I don't know if anyone here is from them. Is it? No? Okay. Uh, so find out who these guys are and know that uh, these guys are really making something cool. So uh, the, the problems that we face there as the Things Network initiators is uh, finding suitable places for placing base stations because people can be a little bit naggy, that is something that's radiating, I'll die in a year or something like that, which is completely not true. So one problem is finding base stations. If you live somewhere in, in Sofia, on a tall building, you have a roof that you can access, please contact these guys and say to them, I can place a gateway on my roof, which is fine. Or you can even buy a gateway, one high-end gateway costs around 300 euros or something, so if you have extra money to spare, please do so. So yeah, I was, I'm Pancha, that was my talk, so thank you for your, uh, thank you for being here, thank you for listening to me, and I hope that this was interesting for you as, as it was for me. Thanks again. So if anyone has questions, I can take a few now, or if you're shy, then you can just approach me and ask me anything here. Okay, you're shy. Okay, thank you again. <laughs>